Welcome back, everyone. It's round two recap from the National Open Tournament in Vegas. If you missed the first recap, it's on my YouTube channel. You can check it out. It's this video right here. Um, and before we get into the game itself, I do want to share a photo from before the game. I was on board two playing one of the top seeds, Grandmaster Benjamin Gladora. A uh, very strong player from Hungary. I believe he's top 150 in the world. Yeah, you can see the FIDE ratings here. So FIDE rating of 2633. Um, I first heard of his name several years ago when he beat Anand. It was like some amazing upset from some tournament. And then I actually got to train with him in St. Louis. Let me see if I have some more photos. Yeah, so I trained with him in St. Louis at uh, Webster University. He's now actually a student there, but even before he was a student, he came to visit and train with our team, and I played some training games with him. So he's uh, he's definitely a very strong player, um, and I knew I had my work cut out for me. So I didn't have much time to prepare. This was a morning round. <clears throat> or no, it was afternoon round? The round started at noon. But I woke up like sometime in the morning and the pairings didn't go up until maybe like an hour or two before. So there wasn't much time to do like extensive opening preparation. Um, but before the game, I decided I would play the London. It's a safe choice. Um, I knew that my preparation is solid enough to hopefully not get a losing position too quickly. Now, unfortunately... He was very well prepared and he blitzed out basically his first 10 moves without too much thought. Um, and he played a very respectable line that I, I did not look at look at this line specifically beforehand. Um, so I'll go ahead and show uh, what he did is went for an early C5. Now, most of the time, Black will have like committed to Knight F6, but he played a move order which avoids a lot of the main lines and he actually delayed knight f6 for so long that later he managed to develop the knight to e7 um, and c5 very respectable uh pressuring the pawn right away enables queen b6 in some cases i play e3 knight c6 knight f3 and then he goes for bishop g4 and even though i'm like a, a very regular london player i play a ton online this is a position I don't encounter too often just because a knight is usually here by now. Um, now, I, I still had some idea what to do. And the next move I play is uh, is actually kind of tricky. It's it's one of the main developing moves is knight b d2. And after I played this move, I screamed out, oh, no, my pawn. Because it looks like black can actually take a pawn on d4 like takes, takes, and then the knight's pinned. Um, I didn't actually scream out, but I, I was imagining like, what would what would the room be like if I just shouted, oh no, my pawn. This is a trap. If black takes a pawn, then I can actually take back, say, oh no, my queen, link below for merch. And if I lose a queen, bishop b5, queen d7, takes, takes, take with a rook and lights up a piece. Um, and this is actually a reverse version of the elephant trap, which can happen in a queen's gambit where black is trapping white. I'll link below. I've, I had some YouTube video recently where I show the elephant trap if people are curious. But basically this pawn, it's defended by tactics. And my opponent was good enough not to fall for such a simple trap. So he plays e6, I play c3. And now... He was very particular with the move order, and uh, he played a move that I was hoping I wouldn't see, but um, it was to be expected. It's pawn takes pawn. Um, now, I'll explain the move I was hoping he would play is knight f6, which on the surface looks like very, very stable for black, just very harmonious piece development, leaving the tension between the pawns. And if we got to this position, I would have been very happy to play this line queen a4 which uh, sets up a really cool trap if black plays one of the most natural moves 
It's the second most played move on Lee Chess, bishop d6. White has an instantly winning move. Like after white's next move, it just wins material on the spot. That move being bishop a6. And this is a this is a London trap that I think most grandmasters would not fall for in like a slow classical game. But I still had like some ounce of hope. Um, now I want to. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of, of the lines which can emerge from here. Um, but if you do want further analysis from this position, I had a pretty extensive lesson a few months ago with Andrea Botez, where we uh, we dug into these lines and I show exactly why that uh, the engine gives plus three for white in this position. So what happened in the game is after pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn. Uh, bishop d6, I'm not really in time to cause much disturbance or tactics on uh, the queen side. And the game actually turns into a more kind of positional battle. Um, I drop back, very typical in London, where you leave the bishop here. So I'm always happy if black wants to exchange on g3 and uh, have me open the h-file. Um, so knight e7 was played, which... I think it's probably more useful than knight f6 just because black stays more flexible, uh, keeps the option open of playing f6, e5, also has possibilities of knight f5. So already at this point, I feel like black kind of got what he wanted in the opening. Um, the position is, is relatively equal, uh, but that's a thing. Like sometimes when you play the London, if black knows what they're doing, they can equalize, but it's still a fight. And the game is not at all determined in the opening. It's determined later on in the middle game and end game, um, as we'll see in this game. So uh, I play bishop e2, castle, and I go for the early knight h4. And this move probably takes some explaining, like, why do I put my knight on the edge? It was mainly to trade off the light squared bishops um, and, and just make the position a, a bit more easier for me to play. This is also a prophylactic move because there's cases where if I castle, then black can get in knight f5 and then I have to either concede the bishop pair or spend more time moving my bishop again and then black can activate further. So we trade on e2, takes, and now I'm hiding the notation um, because black's next move I think is very, very instructive and it's a move that I actually wasn't expecting during the game, um, which I want to pose, pose this as kind of a positional exercise for viewers. Because we, we're reaching a point where the game is transitioning from the opening into the middle game, and it's a question of what Black wants to do in the position. So feel free to pause the video and, and try and figure out like how would you continue play from this position as Black. And before I say what my opponent played, I'll say what I was expecting. I was expecting black to go for a6 and then carry through with b5. And um, I should note that this structure that we have where I'm missing an e-pawn, black is missing a c-pawn, it's called the Carlsbad structure. This can come from a variety of different openings. And usually in this sort of pawn structure, one of the main plans is to minority attack. Um, and by nor minority attack, I mean black has a, a two on three minority. So it's very typical to use a pawn minority, in this case, these two pawns, to lunge forward, ideally play b4, and then create some weakness in my structure. And I, I was kind of beginning to think, like, as, as my opponent was taking time in this position, I was thinking, okay, if a6, I can slow him down with a4 and it's going to take some time before black can expand however my opponent just played b5 immediately and once he played this i realized oh no this minority attack is happening like really really quickly and this move was kind of a blind spot for me because i just assumed without thinking too much further that i could take the pawn um, of course when he played it i realized I can't really get away with taking the pawn without allowing this. And this would be a good trade for black. A move like, let's say, queen a4, rook takes b2. Um, I'd be left with a more glaring weakness on c3. 
the rook would activate. During the game, I was trying to make lines like knight b3 work to trap the rook, but uh, it's it's not too realistic. The, the rook will usually have a square um, if I do end up attacking it. I was dreaming of like castling to trap the rook, but the lines just don't work out. And engine will, will say black's already significantly better here. So during the game, I wasn't entirely sure how to just meet the threat of of b4. Now it's not a tactical threat, but it is a positional threat of weakening my structure. So I decided to throw in a3. Black goes ahead, plays b5. Again, leaving the pawn hanging, but um, pawn is, is not truly hanging because black has rook b8. And then I decide to castle. Um, the plan I went for in this game was to allow the minority attack because it's hard to stop. And I went for the trade, takes on b4. Now it's important for black here not to take back right away. The queen would be overworked here. I would take and then win material. So first black takes on g3, takes and then takes. And got to this position and went for the, the simple plan of bringing my knight to c5. Um, so even though I very likely will wind up with a backwards pawn and an arguably just worse pawn structure in, in the event of takes, takes, I have two, uh, two pawn islands, double pawns aren't so weak, but the backwards pawn on a half open file is not the most pleasant situation. But I did figure that uh, I could get a nice outpost for my knight. And not only is this an outpost, but it it would block the C file, so black would have a harder time actually um, getting to attack the pawn. Now in the game, we got to this position and black played queen b6, which I think is very reasonable, leaving the tension between the pawns. And now the threat of course is to take and attack the knight. So I go in knight c5, threatening the, the fork, rook a7, and I bring my knight back. My knight no longer really had a purpose here um and there's definitely better squares my kingside knight can can go to as we'll see rook eight i trade queen takes and in this position i realized that most of black's pieces are just really out of play um especially far away from the king side so this is an opportunity where um, I can I can try and stir up some initiative on the king side, and that definitely explains my next move, knight g5. And this is a move like I feel like a lot of players might play without seeing a, a clear purpose, but of course I have a very direct threat of queen h5. Um, maybe some reminiscent uh, position to Stafford Gambit uh, attacking these two very delicate pawns. Uh, so black is immediately on the defensive here. And not only am I threatening queen h5, but I'm keeping possibilities of sacking on e6, which could happen in some situations. For example, not sure if this line would work, but knight g6, or, there's some possibility of taking where it takes, takes, and I hit the, the king and knight. And I'm realizing if rook e8 here pinning, I have this move. So black has to be really careful here. And he was careful. In the game, he played very kind of ugly, passive looking move, knight d8, but it does its job kind of defending the two, two of the focal points I, I wanted to target. And I was not expecting this move. Uh, this move was not on my radar, but I was happy to see it given the knight is now just purely defensive. And during the game, I of course considered queen h5 and assumed h6 would lead to just a, a reasonably solid position for black. Like I don't really make much progress. So I, I went the other direction and I played queen b5, um, which is actually a, a nice move because I'm threatening the pawn, but I'm also threatening maiden one, which uh, is kind of surprising that this is a mate threat, but the knight cuts off the back rank and it forces black to do some more awkward things. Um, opponent played knight e to c6. Now I should note knight 
DC6 is also possible, but that would give me the option of repeating. I'm not sure if I would go for repetition, but I think as a higher rated player, by, by a few hundred rating points, my opponent, of course, wanted to keep winning chances alive. And knight dc6, uh, even though it leaves this knight like very stuck on d8, it does kind of cover this. And also, it makes it so I don't really want to take with a pawn. Um, black can't take right away because there's mate, but my pawns would be weak. There's rook b8, and black can win back the pawn. So in this position, I went for queen d3. So I figured my queen did its job. It made the knight move to where the other knight wants to go. So black has what we call superfluous knights. And I keep my initiative by threatening h7. Opponent plays g6. And here I play g4, which that is a, it's a typical move in the structure, not only to fantasize about situations where I can later maneuver the knight around, play g5, and maybe get a knight to f6 someday with a nice outpost, but more, uh, what's the word, more quickly attack with queen h3 and just go after the one of the clear targets in the position. Unfortunately, it turned out g4 was not quick enough because black strikes with queen e7 and uh, my knight's attacked. I don't have time for queen h3. So I play queen e3, and my plan here is now to move the knight back and potentially invade the dark squares. So black plays knight a5, hitting nothing physical, but hitting squares. So there is some idea of knight c4. However, and this is, this is probably one of the most key moments, like if you analyze with the engine, so I, I should address this. This move turned out to be a i think it was either a an accuracy or a mistake um and we can see by the engine evaluation stockfish so says this is equal after knight a5 it gave me the option of taking which i only briefly considered during the game i didn't really want to um make my pawn structure so ugly like this but um this was an opportunity for me one of the biggest opportunities in the game to get the advantage because I keep initiative on the knight. And if knight c4, we just follow the engine line. There's a nice move, queen f4, keeping pressure, very active queen, also preventing rook b8. And if black spends the time to recapture the pawn, I can play rook b1. And white's actually in full control here, where now I have a passed b pawn supported by the rook my knight is happy my other knight's happy black's pieces are kind of sad and defensive so <clears throat> looking back on this i kind of wish i i spent more more time considering pawn takes pawn but i did have different ideas in mind move i played was knight f3 uh going through with my plan of trying to get in queen h6 and like comes back and target h7 uh this did allow knight c4 and after queen h6 Black takes, takes, and plays f6. So very nice move, actually. Not only preventing knight g5, but also just covering h7, maybe some idea of queen g7, but also more likely knight f7, hitting my queen. The move I played here I was happy about, but it turned out uh, to still be complicated. I played g5. Now, of course, uh, for those that watch my Twitch stream and for the subscribers of my Twitch stream, you should know I have the, the G5 emote, which maybe I can show. It's one of my favorite moves in chess because uh, usually whenever you play it, you're either like attacking with a white or you're being crazy with black. You can subscribe on Twitch if you want access to this emote. But when I played in the game, it was for purely positional reasons. I wanted to access e5 square. I also wanted to induce black to play f5. Was f5 played right away? It was, which leaves a very ugly backwards pawn on e6, where I thought going forward from here, I can go put a rook on the e-file and black's going to be purely defensive and I'm controlling e5 enough times. Unfortunately, there were some moves I overlooked coming up very soon. After rook e1, 
black first. Okay, maneuvers a knight, some idea of knight e4. So I play knight e5, I'm still happy. And now knight f7. This is a very precise move. I should note if this knight goes to f7, which looks more natural, there is some possibility of knight takes g6. I actually didn't analyze this afterwards, but this apparently is playable. Um, so other knight coming to f7 makes it so knight takes g6 is less powerful because after takes, 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 king f8. Uh, this pawn, this pawn could be taken, but it's defended. Actually, I don't know what's going on. Queen takes c5? Oh, queen takes e5. Because my queen's also hanging. Stockfish knows best. Anyway, okay, knight, uh, knight 6 f7 was played, I should say. And uh, the game continues. So I uh, I trade first on f7. Takes, takes. And then I move all the way back to h2. And I still was happy with the position um even though g5 looks like it's falling e6 is still weak and i was expecting some line like takes and then um i can't take here immediately but there's some queen f4 move and i thought everything was fine i missed black's next move and after black's next move i thought i was in trouble opponent plays e5 which for some reason i just completely overlooked um, thinking that this was only an option. But e5 was a really nice, also timely move. Even though I have one, two, three attackers, there's only two defenders, my pawn is tied down to defending my knight, and I can't take with a rook because knight takes. So I was feeling the pressure here. And at this point, just because I overlooked e5, I thought I was worse. In reality, I was completely fine. I actually found like the next few best options. Um, I play queen g3, defending the pawn, improving the queen. e4 is played. And then rook to b1. And this turned out to be the best plan, uh, just going for counterplay and basically abandoning the, the g pawn. There is another plan I was considering during, during the game. I was happy I didn't go for it, um, but it looked kind of cool. It was knight d3, intending to maybe play knight e5 or knight f4. This move would fail miserably. And I think this is another good kind of tactical moment for viewers. Um, if you want to pause the video and find the absolutely winning move for black, feel free to do so. I'll admit, I didn't see Black's best move from this position in the game, but we didn't go into this line, so it didn't affect things. Um, but the move Black can play is pawn takes knight, oh no Black's queen, and then d2. And there is no good way to stop the pawn from promoting. Uh, if queen f3, there's rook check. Black will promote and be up a knight. And there's not enough counterplay for white. So it was a funny line, um, but I didn't go into it. I play rook b1, losing a pawn, but getting a check. And after trade, trade, I should mention the time control. We were playing kind of a, a long, slightly unusual time control where on move 40, we get an extra half hour each. But leading up to move 40, I had, I think, less than five minutes. Like, we were both running relatively low on time. And my next few moves, I, I had to play quickly. Um, so queen d8 was played. I played queen b7. And now queen d6. So it's a question, really, if I can stir up enough counterplay with my knight and queen for being down a pawn. And I played queen c8 here king to g7. I think the next move is my 39th move. So I was under pressure time-wise. I had to play quickly. I played knight e6. In hindsight, actually knight e6 engine still says is best. 
Um, but in hindsight, I probably, at the very least, I should have considered queen e6, which was not even a candidate move. But it's a nice idea to go for a queen trade, and if takes, takes, king f6, I can win the d-pawn either with this or this. Um, where I prevent king e6 and I'll win the d-pawn and then this would likely just be a, a pretty routine draw. But I play knight e6, king f6, I move to c7. I thought I was being sneaky because I'm threatening the fork, king can't return to g7, there's also possibilities where I just go and attack the pawn and the queen is the only defender, so... I was feeling relatively good here, but as we'll see, my opponent came up with some really, really nice ideas and actually managed to win the game like pretty quickly. Like this is move 40. I was dead lost. Like the game just ended on move 49. So Lack won this position in nine more moves, which looking back, it's kind of hard to predict how my position can go south really quickly. But uh, we will see. So he starts with king g5. Now in this position, I played knight e6. My first intention was to play queen b7 thinking, ooh, I'm winning a pawn. Unfortunately, there's knight e8. And I don't have any time to take the pawn. If, if I take with queen, I lose my knight. And if I take with knight, I lose my queen. So then I was kind of sad, and that's why I played knight e6, thinking, okay, I'll keep trying to harass the king. And my opponent pretty quickly played king g4, so walking up further. And it's a really unusual situation where the king has delved into my territory, but the pawns shelter the king from a different side than usual. It's like... It's like holding an umbrella, but you're sheltering your feet because the water is coming from the reverse, or like the ground is raining. I don't know. Analogies are hard sometimes. So anyway, I was slightly flustered, but the game keeps going, and I play c4. And I'll say that c4 was my intention. I think I was more expecting king h6. But the reason why I play c4 was to try and resolve the the backwards pawn on c3 and i will say this this is my worst move of the game like c4 was was a really really bad blunder but it's not so obvious why it's so bad so i played c4 thinking okay i'm either gonna get in c5 and get a defended passer or we'll trade I take with queen, keep my knight defended, and then I have a pass d-pawn, and then there's room to try and target black's king. And I was dreaming of, uh, of situations where black will just get mated with the king here, like king h4 only legal move, check here, and then mate. Of course, none of that happened. And my opponent played the next move relatively quickly, which kind of bedazzled me because the next move I, I just disregarded pretty quickly when I had played c4 next move being queen b4 and I had disregarded this because I have queen c7 here so like during the game in this position I was calculating okay c4 I saw queen b4 as an option I assumed okay queen c7 just refutes everything it hits a knight it's threatens many nasty checks, actually just force mate threat against the king. Um, and I assumed, okay, queen b4 is not possible. My mistake was I didn't look far enough. I only looked, what, two moves ahead? Like one and then two. Um, I should have looked at least like five or six moves ahead. And this was like the key separating factor between my level and his level, at least in this moment, is, is looking far enough and uncovering kind of a, a hidden resource in uh, in the variation. Um, is after queen b4, 
Okay, I play queen c7. I don't have too many other options as queen e1's a threat. It turns out that black is completely winning here. And after queen e1, only legal move king h2, queen takes f2. And all of a sudden, black is just preventing the two checks I wanted to do. Black is also sacrificing a knight, which I did end up taking. Um, at this moment, I realized, oh, I'm in trouble, but there's not much I can do like otherwise. So I took the knight, and after check, king g1, e3. It's such a weird position. I was actually really impressed Like during the game. My opponent was playing relatively quickly, like found queen b4 pretty quickly, and probably just like saw the, the possibility of this line. And... The problem for white here, even though I have a queen and knight, the black king is on g4, I have no effective way of attacking the king, and black just wants to make a new queen. So I took a lot of time here, like searching for any possible resource. Probably took like 10 or 15 minutes because I don't want to resign if, if there's some like brilliant comeback. But, uh, it turns out the, the position is just defenseless for white. And the, the king is actually a useful attacking piece. And the, the pawns keep it safe. In the game, I played queen c7. Um, hoping for some miracle queen f4. But then after queen f2. So now the queen again defends these squares. I play king h2. e2. I have no checks. And black is ready to make a queen. I tried one more move, queen digs h7, hoping and praying black would queen, and then I can beautiful mate like this, but then queen g3, and that's just mate in two. I actually resigned here. I guess I could have played this and given my opponent the chance to underpromote to rook with mate, but, um, but it was actually a really nice finish from black, and going from a position... Which Stockfish says is actually very close to equal here. He found the one the one way to like create winning chances and it put me in a, a tough situation. Um looking back on this, I guess Stockfish does want me to play this, allow this, and just put the queen here. Um, but there's there's still kind of a nagging edge for black given that there's an extra pawn. The pawn majority can be scary in some situations and the game just continues. So anyway, it was a cool game. I I wasn't too upset after losing this game given that my opponent just found a really, really nice idea and the tactical line really wasn't so obvious. The, the thing I, I should really improve on next time is heightening my awareness for danger levels. Now I've I reviewed this game on on live stream. I think the evening uh it was played and I I mentioned to my uh my chat that during some of my games in Vegas I had the the danger levels rap from Gotham Chess stuck in my mind. But I really should have had actual danger levels of being aware when my king is a potential target and if i just looked a few moves further maybe i would have come up with a better move apparently queen e8 is the best try here and then would still take a lot of work for black to convert this position so anyway i think that turned out to be a long recording wow yeah that's uh is gonna be over a half hour video but i hope people enjoyed that let me know if you made it to the end and uh if you have any questions feel free to leave a comment I'll leave a link to this Lee Chess study where I do all the analysis. So if you want to analyze on your own or with the engine and opening book, you can do so. And uh, stay tuned for another recap. Also stay tuned for more live streams. Um, if you follow me on Twitch, I'll be streaming on the coming days and you can get notified when I go live.